welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we are going to be taking a look at an old case which was suggested by listener Paul in the Facebook discussion group. So thank you for that suggestion. In 1889 a strange story would unfold in central Manchester which would come to be known as the Manchester Cab Mystery. This case would attract huge national intrigue and would involve a very dedicated police officer to eventually solve it. As always, this episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. In the 1800s, Manchester had grown rapidly in lots of different ways. By the mid-1800s, it was one of the biggest manufacturers of cotton in the world and had gained the nickname of Cottonopolis. Mills could be seen across the skyline in most directions, and the cotton exchange in the centre of the city was a hub for mill owners and business people who had an interest in Manchester's textile industry. The population of Manchester had also rapidly grown during the 1800s. This was in part due to the growth of the cotton industry and jobs being available, but also the potato famine caused a large number of Irish people to come to the city in search of work. There were also other immigrants who travelled to Manchester from Europe during the 1800s and the city became a very culturally diverse place to be. The population almost doubled from 1861 to 1891 and the industrial growth didn't stop there as in 1893 the Manchester Ship Canal opened allowing further trade to be made this way. This also brought many more jobs into the area. This growing city was home to many people working in mills or industry, and also those who owned and led these companies as well. John Fletcher was 50 in 1889, and various reports about him describe him as a paper manufacturer. Angela Buckley's book, The Real Sherlock Holmes, The Hidden Story of Jerome Caminada, has a chapter about the Manchester Cab mystery, which describes John Fletcher as a respected businessman and as a senior partner at a paper manufacturer's located in the city centre. It is reported that he was a well-known face amongst these in the industry, and Buckley explains that he was often seen at the exchange buildings. Working in the paper industry was a common career at the time, and he was also respected in other areas of his life, as Buckley explains that he was also elected a Justice of the Peace which meant that he had an influence on what happened within his jurisdiction in relation to ensuring people abided by the law. While this was an unpaid role, it came with a large amount of respect and prestige, and Buckley also states in her book that Fletcher became an elected member of Lancashire County Council. John Fletcher would often be seen out and about in the city, and despite the fact that he had retired from the company at this point, he was known to people in the city. On the 26th of February 1889, John Fletcher travelled into Manchester City Centre with the intention of attending a mill sale at a hotel called the Mitre Hotel, which is located close to Manchester Cathedral and is at the centre of the shopping district of the city in the present day. He was seen by a number of different people at the pub that day. In Angela Buckley's book, she describes that some of his colleagues said that he was somewhat under the influence of drink but that he was in full possession of his faculties. It is then known that he made an appointment to meet some of his colleagues at a fish restaurant called Sinclair's later on that night. This, however, is an appointment that John Fletcher would never make it to. Later on that evening, John Fletcher was seen to hail a handsome cab with a younger gentleman, and they went to a pub called the Three Arrows. After being seen to have a drink in the pub, they then hailed another handsome cab, and asked the driver to take them to Stretford Road, which is close to the area of Old Trafford. It is known that while the pair travelled towards Stretford Road, their journey was hindered by a procession advertising Mexican Joe's Wild West show that had taken up the roadway. This significantly slowed down the pair's progress, and it was then that the driver noticed that a pedestrian was shouting something to him. The passerby told the driver that one of the passengers from the back of the handsome cab had jumped out of the back and had ran down a nearby street. 
This was very strange news to receive, and the driver got out of the cab and went to the back to have a look what was going on. As he opened the door to the cab, he saw something alarming. John Fletcher was slumped down in his seat, and the younger gentleman was nowhere to be seen. The scene was odd, and the cab driver thought for a moment, and it is reported that he then attempted to rouse John Fletcher, who reportedly said, Go away and leave me alone. The cab driver then shut the door and decided to drive back to the cathedral where the pair had been picked up. When he arrived, he once again got out and went to look in the cab. This time, John Fletcher appeared unconscious and could not be roused. Angela Buckley in her book describes that the cab driver caught the attention of a police constable who suggested that he take the passenger to the police station as he was clearly drunk. Drinking was quite a big pastime in the 19th century and people would often be arrested for being drunk and disorderly in public. The cab driver, however, did not agree with him and decided as he was unconscious to take him to Manchester Royal Infirmary instead to be treated medically. He drove him there and upon arrival he discovered that he was too late. John Fletcher was already dead. This news was shocking as everyone began to question what exactly had happened in the cab and crucially in the hours before the incident. The news spread quickly the day after John Fletcher died. Many shocked that a respected businessman could have died in such a way. The newspapers, in the days after it had happened, started to report the incident with headlines like the Manchester cab mystery and the strange death in a car. The response by police to John Fletcher's death under very strange circumstances was immediate. Manchester police placed Jerome Caminada in charge of the investigation, and it began straight away. By 1889, Caminada was a well-known officer in the city centre and was extremely well respected. He had been born in the city in 1844 to Irish and Italian parents and he first began work as an engineer. He quickly decided, however, that he wanted to become a police officer. He started working for the police in 1868. During Victorian times, Manchester had a number of problems with crime, such as drunkenness and robbery and Caminada was very dedicated to stamping it out. He was concerned with making the Manchester police force more efficient, and looked at many different ways that he could do this. He was well respected by different sections of society, and he also became known nationally due to his impressive record of arrests. It is reported that he was responsible for the imprisonment of 1,225 people, and the closure of 400 public houses and it earned him a promotion. By 1889, Caminada was an inspector and was known to catch the perpetrator. The investigation began by looking closely at the scene and what exactly had happened to John Fletcher. He did not have any marks on his body or any signs that violence had taken place. His body was sent to be analysed by hospital surgeons to check what, if anything else, could have happened to him. One of the things that bothered investigators was that John Fletcher did not appear to have any valuables on him at all. This seemed odd, as Fletcher was a wealthy man and investigators believed that he would have had some things such as money or a watch. Investigators began to piece together where Fletcher had been in the hours before his death and it turned out that they were able to establish quite an accurate timeline of where he had been that day. Colleagues told Caminada that he had been at the offices that morning and then had travelled into the city. Investigators were told that he was going to a mill sale at the Mitre Hotel. When speaking to witnesses at the hotel, they were able to establish that Fletcher had been there. This is where Caminada learned that John Fletcher had seemed somewhat drunk. This information was of interest to police as this was several hours before his death. Caminada then learnt that Fletcher had been seen again that evening, but this time in the Three Arrows pub, not too far away. This time, however, he was not alone. A younger gentleman had joined him, and they had both had a pint, and then left to get in the cab, where he was later found dead. Caminada was now extremely interested to find out who the other man was, and he began to make inquiries about who might have seen this mystery man. 
He also knew that the man had jumped out of the cab while it was stuck behind the parade on the pair's way to Stretford. Caminada began here with this lead and decided to visit the area where the man had been seen running away, close to Oxford Road in the centre of the city. Angela Buckley states in her book how Caminada began to make inroads in the investigation. He asked around about a man that fit the description given by the cab driver and it led him to a beer house called the York Minster. Witnesses at this beer house stated that they had seen a man that fit the description and he was wearing a waistcoat and a gold watch and chain. He had a drink and then asked the landlord if he had any change as he pulled out some gold and silver coins. He told the witnesses at the beer house that he was a stranger from London. He then left and hailed a cab at about half eight that night. Caminada was sure that this description fit that of his suspect, however he needed more information. He decided to find the cabman who took the man from the beer house and discovered that he had taken him to another public house called the Locomotive Inn. Angela Buckley describes that the cabman was also able to shed some light on the man. He stated that he sat at the front of the cab with him for a while and then went back inside. The cabman noticed that he was wearing a watch, just as had been noted by those in the beer house. Caminada was sure that this watch also fit the description of one that was missing from John Fletcher. This was useful information as Caminada also began to think closely about the locomotive inn, where the man was taken in the cab. Caminada had extensive experience of policing the city centre and knew the different public houses well and this was an advantage in the investigation. He knew that the Locomotive Inn was known for illegal fighting contests, and he was interested in finding out if any of the locals who went in the pub matched the description of this suspect. The investigation had only been going for a couple of days, however Caminada had made some significant progress. While he was speaking to witnesses to create an image of the suspect, the initial hospital surgeon report about John Fletcher's cause of death was complete. It was clear that he had been drinking significantly before his death, and this had been one of the contributing factors to what happened to him. Dr Julius Dreschfeld, who was a physician at the Manchester Royal Infirmary where John Fletcher had been taken, reported on his cause of death. The Shields Daily Gazette and Shipping Telegraph on the 18th of March 1889 states that Dr Julius Dreschfeld explained that he believed his cause of death was syncope due to alcohol consumption, combined with chloral poisoning. Chloral hydrate was used to sedate people for purposes of medical procedures, and the presence of this in John Fletcher's body was a concern. Why had he consumed chloral hydrate? The combined effects of the alcohol and the chloral hydrate had caused a fatal reaction and led to his death. Caminada now knew that he was looking for someone that had possibly poisoned Fletcher as a means to rob him of his possessions. The question now was, who was it? The medical report was very helpful to Caminada as it did confirm a lead that he had already been looking into. The connection to the locomotive inn. Caminada had been compiling a list of people who frequented the pub and had been matching them to his suspect. He immediately came upon John Parton, who lived close to the locomotive inn, and who had been known for drugging victims as a means to rob them. He also reportedly drugged the fighters who took part in the illegal fights at the locomotive inn, as a way of rigging the competitions. He soon discovered that John's son, Charles Parton, closely matched the description of the suspect. Could this be the man who was in the cab with John Fletcher? Caminada did some more digging into the family and in their home city of Liverpool, and he soon discovered another connection that possibly pointed to Charles Parton. On the 19th of February 1889, a man had gone into a chemist and asked for some chloral hydrate. As he asked for too much, the chemist would not sell him the drug, so the man snatched it and ran out with around a pound of the substance. It's a very interesting lead and the police believe that it was relevant to what had happened to John Fletcher. There were also other suspicious incidents that had been happening in the area. 
Two other men reported that they believed they had been drugged and robbed while drinking at local pubs in Manchester. This circumstantial evidence, the link to the robbery in Liverpool, and the description matching Charles Parton, led to him being arrested initially for stealing from John Fletcher. His arrest took place on the 2nd of March, just four days after Fletcher's death. He was charged with stealing a watch and a sum of money from Mr Fletcher, and it is reported that he denied these allegations. In Angela Buckley's book it is stated that Charles Parton said he had been at a greyhound race in Liverpool on the night that Fletcher had died. A judge held him on the charges and his defence would not be helped by the fact that both cabmen were able to point him out in an identity parade as the man that they had transported. Charles Parton was held until the 5th of March when once again he was before the magistrate's court. During these proceedings the inquest on the body of Mr Fletcher was resumed and information about his cause of death was once again discussed. In the Sheffield Daily Telegraph newspaper on the 6th of March, it is reported that the police were presenting evidence that Parton had been with Fletcher at the time of his death. Parton's solicitor stated that a fresh analysis of the deceased's stomach contents would be advisable. The police and prosecution, led by Mr Cobbett, presented the witness who had been robbed at the chemist in Liverpool, who explained that Parton had been the one to steal the chloral hydrate from his shop. The prosecution described Parton as depressed. At the end of this inquest, the jury returned a verdict of willful murder against Charles Parton. The interest in the case was huge in the general area, and the public were extremely interested in knowing what was going to happen next. The story was indeed mysterious, and the fact that Jerome Caminada was involved in the case also seemed to give it an extra air of celebrity. This meant that many people were invested in its outcome. Despite the amount of investigation that had gone into the case, the evidence was not necessarily concrete and was quite circumstantial, relying on witness testimony and previous bad character. The links between the places involved that evening and Charles Parton, however, were deemed suspicious. The fact that other people also came forward with similar stories of being drugged and robbed also added to the suspicion that the same person had definitely been involved. These witnesses had identified Parton as the man that had robbed them. On the 8th of March, newspapers reported that the case had resumed once more at Manchester City Police Court. As reported in the Hull Daily Mail, the interest in the case seemed in no way diminished. Medical evidence from a Manchester City analyst called Mr Estcourt was again discussed. Charles Parton's solicitor argued that he would show that John Fletcher's death was due to natural causes and he had contributed to his own death. He also stated that Parton was at home by 6pm the night of Fletcher's death. Two other charges were also brought against Parton, which were related to the other two men who had come forward to say that he had robbed them. These charges were added and Parton was committed to trial for murder. The Shields Daily Gazette and Shipping Telegraph newspaper reported on the 12th of March that a grand jury had found a true bill against Charles Parton at Liverpool Assizes. This true bill means that the grand jury had heard enough evidence from the prosecution to believe that Charles Parton was probably guilty of the crime, and they decided to indict him for the murder of John Fletcher. When the trial began on the 18th of March, the public waited with bated breath to hear what the outcome would be in this sensational trial. The court was crowded with people. It was overseen by Mr Justice Charles, and the prosecution set out their theory that Charles Parton had drugged John Fletcher with chloral hydrate before robbing him of his possessions and escaping out of the cab. Charles Parton pleaded not guilty. The prosecution, however, were able to produce another witness which was pivotal to the case. Caminada and his investigators had been able to track down a witness from the Three Arrows pub that night where Fletcher and his friend had been seen having a drink. Mr Phillips, the witness, a bookkeeper, said he was in the pub that night and saw Mr Fletcher with a man. The Cambridge Daily News on the 18th of March reported that Mr Phillips went to the police court to satisfy himself of prisoner's identity before giving evidence. 
Mr Phillips explained that he saw the prisoner empty the contents of a small round bottle into one of the glasses before them. He also stated he did not interfere, thinking accused was taking medicine. It is also reported in the Hull Daily Mail that Parton then held up both glasses as though looking through them, and then he returned the small bottle into his pocket. The fact that someone had seen Charles Parton administering something into one of the glasses that night was very alarming and compelling evidence to his guilt. Mr Phillips did not come forward straight away as he did not immediately feel that anything was wrong with what he had seen. The trial resumed the next day on the 19th of March and medical evidence was once again heard. Mr Charles Estcourt once again discussed the fact that there were indications of chloral found in Mr Fletcher's intestines. Dr Julius Dreshfield at the Manchester Royal Infirmary explained the cause of death was syncope from a combination of alcohol and chloral hydrate poisoning. The defence refuted this, explaining that the prisoner did not administer the poison and that Mr Fletcher's death was from alcohol poisoning alone. At the end of the second day, the judge summed up and the jury was sent to deliberate. It did not take long for the jury to return with a verdict and they found Charles Parton guilty of the murder of John Fletcher. He was sentenced to death. This appeared to bring a close to the Manchester cab mystery and the newspapers reported that after his conviction, it came to light that Parton had actually confessed to the murder. The Gloucester Journal reported on the 23rd of March that Parton said, I gave him more than I intended, and when we came out of the Three Arrows, I saw he was a goner, so I put him in a cab and got away as soon as I could. He had said this to a man who could not later be traced, however another witness told the police of this confession. In the days after Parton's conviction, a petition was set up by the public to commute his death sentence. It is reported that over 1,000 people had signed it, and Parton's father was also appealing to the public for their sympathy. This petition was delivered to the Home Secretary in April, and it was decided to commute his capital sentence. His sentence was changed to life imprisonment. This was due to the fact that there was the belief that the prisoner was unaware of the potency of the drug administered by him. The Manchester cab mystery continued to be controversial, however, as some in the medical profession began to doubt the way in which the poisoning had been portrayed in the trial. In the Northern Daily Telegraph on the 1st of April, it was reported that Dr E. Gumbert from Manchester had addressed a letter to the British Medical Journal in condemnation of the sentence passed by the court. It states, The verdict he considers is utterly wrong. He maintains that the death of Mr Fletcher was most probably not caused by a dose of chloral hydrate and this might have been evident to the prosecution if we had a system of trying to find the truth in such cases as is customary in the continental states. He also stated that the very short duration of the investigation and the trial of just three weeks means a proper investigation was not done. He maintained that the immediate cause of death was syncope as a result of alcohol poisoning, which is what the defence also stated at trial. In the report published by Dr Gumbert in the Medical Journal, he states that his whole point hinges on the result of the chemical analysis being incompatible in my opinion with the assumption of the medical witnesses that a quantity of chloral had been administered to Mr Fletcher, large enough to have been instrumental in causing death. Despite the rumblings after the trial that perhaps not enough time had been spent investigating the murder, Jerome Caminada was praised for his quick and efficient investigation. He became the city's first CID superintendent in 1897, and his methods of investigation were deemed to be effective, and he was widely respected in the area. He retired in 1899, and was a city councillor for the area of Openshaw from 1907 to 1910. He died in 1914 at the age of 70. Angela Buckley in her book discusses how she believes there were many parallels between Caminada and Sherlock Holmes. This is due to the fact that Caminada was a national figure at the time that Arthur Conan Doyle was writing, and his methods were different to other police officers at the time. 
The Manchester cab mystery is a very interesting case, as although it appears very conclusive initially, some believe that there is not enough evidence to point to Parton directly. I am very interested to hear what you think of the case, and if there are any parts that you are not sure about. Thank you for listening to the episode, and thank you to Paul for recommending the case this week. I used Angela Buckley's book, The Real Sherlock Holmes, The Hidden Story of Jerome Caminada, to help me in this episode, and I would really recommend that you read it if you are interested in his other cases. I will link the book in the episode notes. I would not have been able to do this episode without her amazing insights and research into the case, so I'd like to stress how useful it was. Angela Buckley also has a website called Victorian Super Sleuth, where she looks into lots of different cases. So if you are interested in cases from this time, then you should definitely have a look at the website. I want to thank everyone who has supported the podcast this week with recommendations on Facebook and lovely comments. If you want to support the podcast, you can leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a recommendation on our Facebook page or just tell someone else about the podcast. If you want to let me know what you think about the episode, you can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or you can email me at theunseenpod at gmail.com. I always appreciate hearing your thoughts and suggestions, and I always try to cover them if I can, just like this one this week. I would like to let everyone know that I'm having a week off this week to attempt to catch up with episodes and get some other things done. Thank you for your support with this. Once again, thanks for listening. I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Thank you.